afternoon. Th th thank you for taking the time, Mr. Secretary. We were talking before about, you know, we've been trying to will Semaphore into existence as you do a startup, and how your presidential campaign was one of the incredible acts of all time of, of that kind of will. Um, but in any case... I hope that's a good thing. You and you now, and, and what in your, your prize is really one of the most difficult and interesting jobs in government um, as Secretary of Transportation, and one of the hardest. And there's really been, I mean, I, I guess if you're Secretary of Transportation, there's always a run of disasters. But there's been a really, you've had, you've had um, train derailments, doors flying off airplanes, and now a bridge collapse. And I guess I wonder just to start, I assume you get a call 1.30 in the morning on the 26th. Like, what was your first reaction to the Baltimore Bridge? What was that, you know, how does it come to you? Yeah. You know, the, the last thing I do at night, I put my phones on a dresser across the room so I'm not tempted to, to keep myself awake scrolling in bed. And as I, as I kind of pulled up the sheets, I thought, did I, did I turn the ringer on on my work phone? I got back out of bed, walked across, <laughs> turned the ringer on, and, uh, and then went to sleep. And, of course, middle of the night, phone call comes in. Uh, next thing you know, I'm talking to my team. I'm, uh, I'm talking to Governor Moore. I'm talking to the White House. And there is a part of the job that has really been about contending with just different things that happen, whether it's the plug door in Alaska Airlines, the, 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 uh, the uh, incident that happened in Baltimore, or anything else. Our goal is to make sure that we can contend with all of that, but have that account for 49% or less of our time and attention because we are also by design the department that's supposed to be thinking about the longest term, right? We're building things. We, we are almost by necessity making 80 year decisions when we work on a bridge somewhere. Yeah. Even as you're working on an up to the minute basis on things like the day to day responsibilities of the FAA, which handles uh, about 40,000 flight operations every day. I think something that applies to really both of those short term and long term things. I think there's this incredible hunger right now in the country to see stuff get built fast. Josh yep. Shapiro is going to you know, run for president in four years on the strength of having repaired I-95 I fast. And I'm curious if, um, A, is this bridge going to ruin Westmore's career? And B, you know, is there a role for you in clearing some of the, you know, I think there's a debate about what it is. Is it labor standards, environmental standards, lethargy, the private sector, whatever it is. Is there a role for you? Have you had success in, I mean, in clearing that stuff away so that things can be built again? Yeah. First, first of all, specifically to, to Baltimore, I think Governor Moore has done a fantastic job. And there's always, whether it's with, with Governor Shapiro when I-95 happened or, or now in Baltimore, it, it really is all about the handshake between state and federal. Because with the exception of the FAA, our department actually doesn't run much. Uh, we don't run railroads, we regulate them. We don't run highways and bridges, we fund them. And so the, the puzzle is always, how do we take all of these pulleys and levers of the government, formal ones and informal ones, and use them to help the people who are on the ground, including my, my uh, fellow former mayors or former fellow mayors, uh, to, to actually get these things done. But I think what you're describing is also a much bigger issue and a very real problem, which is the United States takes longer and spends more building big things. And we are in the business as a department of building good things well. One do, way do you I think, think the it's right to blame the Democratic Party for that? No, of course not. <laughs> um, no, and I would add, um, and I'm not being partisan. And I don't even I'm mean just, like right now. I mean historically. I'm just observing yep. that, uh, you know, I seem to remember another administration here in Washington saying they were going to do a big infrastructure package, and it was a punchline, right? Uh, and, and, and I would say this infrastructure package got done on a bipartisan basis. So, again, I don't mean to be partisan about it, but I will say that people – Laughed at President Biden. There's a difference between building an infrastructure, passing an infrastructure package and putting a thing out and building a bridge. Yes, right? exactly. So that's what we're in the middle of right now. We got the $1.2 trillion. About half of that is transportation. But if we can be 1% more efficient on a $1.2 trillion package, or let me put it in, in the reverse, if we are 1% less efficient than we should be on a $1.2 trillion package, then $10 billion of value disappears. And so it is critically important to deliver these projects efficiently and swiftly, but it's also critically important to make sure that they happen with integrity. President Biden is very proud of the work that he did during the Obama stimulus package, making sure that waste, fraud, and abuse in that package was, was held to an absolute minimum. The pressure is on us to do the same. And we've already got something like 50,000 projects going on across the country. So we have to be rigorous and meticulous enough that they get done right 
and at the same time be swift enough and flexible enough that they get done, period. And there is a lot of muscle memory in federal bureaucracies that is all about making sure nothing goes wrong. Sometimes to the, to the detriment of making sure things happen at all, getting that balance right is, is really, I think, at the absolute heart of what we do. I put some of the best minds at the Department of Transportation on exactly this question. It can't just be fire and forget. Congratulations, South Bend, Indiana, you got the grant. Uh, we'll call you if you break any laws with it, right? It's got to be working hand in hand with our project sponsors. And remember, we're not the ones procuring or building any of this stuff. We're funding it. We're overseeing it. But we have to help an organization, whether it's an entity like... Uh, like like the, the Gateway Development Commission doing the Hudson Tunnel in New York, which will be one of the biggest public works projects east of the Mississippi in this century. Or whether it's a community like, like Chamberlain, South Dakota, that's got 2,500 people but also happens to have an airport, which really matters because they use it for air ambulance missions, and their general aviation terminal consists of a mobile home, basically, and we're giving them a six-figure grant to turn it into an actual building. But they've probably never had a federal grant of that type before. And across that whole spectrum, we've got to engage the partners to actually get it done. Now, one other thing I would mention, everybody will say the reason things take long in this country is because we care too much about labor and environmental standards. That cannot be the case because I have seen it done very, very swiftly in places like France and Germany and Spain that nobody could argue that, that Europe, Western European states are less committed to labor yeah. and environmental protections than we are, but they have figured out ways to go more quickly. We've got to do the same. On the, on the, on the, on the agency you, you operate and run, the FAA, um, I'm told that you're the the Department of Transportation Inspector General is currently is now auditing, I think this is news, the, um, the FAA's oversight of 737s and 787s. Is, has, I mean, I guess, will you kind of cooperate with that IG investigation, but also, is that agency just get too close to Boeing? So, first of all, it's very healthy for the IG to be constantly auditing everything that happens across the DOT. That's what they do. And I remember that... So it's just a coincidence they happen to be auditing... This right well, look, now. obviously when something's in the news, they're going to take a closer look, the same way we're taking a closer look at Boeing, mm -hmm. right? We also have a framework created by Congress where uh, not everybody involved in, in the safety process on aircraft design is a government employee. So the way it works is we set standards, and then the company is responsible for meeting them, and then we do, of course, a level of checking to make sure they did. There's a spectrum on how this kind of oversight happens, right? On one extreme... Do you, I guess, do you think that the spectrum is set too close to the industry, too close to the company right now? Understanding that you inherited this, that yeah. this is the framework? Yeah. No. And, and the reason I say that is... Or let me qualify that a bit, actually, because we're examining everything that we've done. But what I'll say is, no, it doesn't have to be if we get this right. And that's what was at stake when Mike Whitaker, our FAA administrator, said this is not going to business as usual at mm -hmm. Boeing. We're not even going to let them increase their production unless they demonstrate that they can do it safely. So in other words, you can't just say it's about the structure. We're always going to revisit the structure mm -hmm. from time to time. But it's about what you do within that structure. And are we holding our regulated entity's feet to the fire appropriately, whether we're talking about an aircraft manufacturer or an airline, or for that matter, a freight railroad, which mm -hmm. right now, uh, two of the biggest freight railroads in the country are suing us because we put out a rule saying that on a two mile long freight train, generally you have to have two people on board. That, that, I, I'm not making this up. Uh, that, that, they, they view that as, as wild regulatory overreach yeah. on our part. So th there's always going to be a push-pull with whoever we're regulating, but that's how we establish the safety culture that we have. Right now we're moving in heaven and earth to deal with the aftermath of a plug door blowing out on that airplane because somebody could have been killed. We now need to take that same level of rigor, not only maintain it and up it in aviation, but start applying it in roadway safety where a number of people equivalent to a fully loaded 737 died yesterday and will again today and will again tomorrow. And it's not headline news at all. Yeah, it's, it's been, and move, moving to from the planes, the trains, the automobiles here, um, talking uh, EVs. It's an issue that has gone for, that has polarized so intensely, and I think you're probably the democratic democratic figure goes on Fox most has been most nimble in talking to Republicans about some of these economic issues. But I, I mean, I saw Marjorie Taylor Greene, everybody's favorite member of Congress, said the other day that Pete Buttigieg can take his electric vehicles and his bicycles, and he and his husband can stay out of girls' bathrooms, which is just sort of a mishmash of culture. Yeah, war. I don't even know like why would I want a vehicle to 
it just, just doesn't even. You're gonna drive the vehicle. <laughs> You're saying you'll drive your vehicle into the men's room? And is the bicycle in the vehicle? Is the yeah, yeah, maybe she's saying we should only drive electric vehicles into men's room. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I think the real question here is like, I mean, are you just worried that this is just becoming another one of these partisan issues in a way that will cripple the industry? Look, it is amazing when literally anything can be turned into an ideological or partisan issue. I think the fact that something like public health got turned into a partisan issue cost lives uh, in, uh, in, in the mm -hmm. response and recovery to COVID. But I think it doesn't have to. And, and the good news is they're actually good cars and they're going to save people money. So there are certain forces, even today, that are in fact more powerful even than ideology and partisanship. And some of those forces are the forces that have made America what it is, which is when a great product or a, a superior product is introduced at the expense of an inferior product, especially as it becomes more affordable, people choose the superior product. And look, there's a lot at stake, not just in converting to EVs. We all know the environmental stakes of that. There's a lot at stake in making sure that happens in the US. The Trump administration allowed China to build a big head start in EVs. And I promise you it's not because the Chinese Communist Party is full of environmental enthusiasts. It's because they understand the economic and strategic value of dominating the market that is clearly where light duty vehicles are headed. I grew up in a city haunted by the spectacle of an 800,000 square foot factory with broken windows looming over our downtown that was just one of dozens associated with the Studebaker car company that went out of business because they couldn't keep up with the times. I know exactly what the stakes are if you have an industry that can't keep up with the Is times. Is this an industry, though, that can only succeed if you don't let Americans buy superior I think cheaper. we're out of time. I have one more question for you yeah. as a, I can't remember what it's called, the Amtrak guest rewards thing where you get to go to that nice lounge, but as a, as a you know, charter member, although I never quite get that top status, um, are we going to get those high-speed rail cars out like this week, this month? When, when do I get to see one of those things uh, in the Northeast Corridor? And will President Biden be on it? Uh, I'm pretty sure it'll be hard to keep President Biden off of the, uh, uh, the newest train car. He was, I was in a meeting with him, and he was asking so many questions about the tech specs of the new Acela cards that we had to call Amtrak to get the answer. Um, <laughs> I don't have a date for you. That's, that, that's, uh, I'd go to Amtrak for that. But, but what I would say is whether we're talking about the Northeast Corridor or the, the uh, project to link Las Vegas to Southern California, we are in for a really exciting period in, in high-speed rail. I think anybody, any American who's traveled abroad uh, sees what they have, not just famously in Japan or China, but in you know, like Italy, and yeah. comes back and says, why can't we have nice things? We're finally changing that. I mean, not overnight, but we're changing that. All right. You heard it here first. You can have nice things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much.